All right, guys, I noticed the uh, camera battery here is running low, so again, I'll try to go through this quickly, okay? Uh, mutual funds, chapter three, overview of the industry structure. A lot of good, quizzable, excellent to know information here, okay? Introduction, approximately 8,000 different funds exist right as of uh, the printing of this book. Uh, money comes from 90 million different private investors and institutional investors, okay? Industry comprised of many different components that may or may not be part of a single company. And we'll go into why that is. So areas for growth. The industry has seen consistent growth in AUM, which is uh, stands for assets under management, right? Which is how much money the firm is managing. For 20 years through 2003, there was only two years where AUM shrunk. I can guarantee you that it also shrunk between 2007 and 2010 at least once. Okay? Securities in general rise in value over time. At the very least, that's because of inflation, right? Um, but that might have something to do with other factors as well. But as long as there's moderate inflation, security prices will rise. Okay? Uh, capital gains. Uh, what are capital gains? Fixed income, uh, which are bonds, pay interest. And some equities pay dividends. Okay? Those are capital gains. So when we hear in the news, they want to tax capital gains. We're talking about fixed income and uh, dividends. Okay. Fee-based industry. I talked about this a little bit in chapter two. Most in increases in value go to the shareholders. So if the stock goes up by 10, or the mutual fund goes up by 10%, guess what? You're going to get, the as the investor, you're going to get um, most of those gains, right? But the investment manager, the mutual fund, might still, it might, well, will still take approximately 1% uh, investment management fee. So, if the whole portfolio goes up by 10%, you, you know, the investment manager is still gaining from the outperformance of the fund. Some funds even have a performance fee that says something like, you know, if the fund outperforms the market by greater than 8%, we take 20% of all profits after the 8%. Uh, that's not uncommon, okay? Uh, and why would a manager do that? They might have a lower management fee but really believe in their performance, so they might put an incentive on their high performance in order to recapture some of the gains. So, it's comprised of these things. Management company. They handle the fund administration, investment advisory, distribution, customer service. Okay? That's the management company. Some of these things, these factors can all be within the same house, same business, or they can be separated. Right? Uh, directors are paid a fixed amount, by the fund to watch out for shareholder interests. Okay? Third party serv service providers, that can be like printing of books, marketing material, uh, you know, delivery of books, uh, printing services, um, lock boxes, like the, the way they handle deposits for their accounts. Um, now, if you're a very large organization, you're gonna handle that in-house. However, if you're a smaller organization, you're gonna outsource that to a third party. Okay? Broker and other financial intermediaries handle the distribution of the fund and are either paid directly by the investor or indirectly by the fund. And then there's industry associations, so we'll get to that later. Okay. Funds have an understanding of the 1940 Act and why some of these rules were enacted. Okay. This is just stuff for a quiz. Okay. Name rule. The name rule is very important and it's an easy concept to understand. If I call my mutual fund the Emerging Markets Mutual Fund. By putting that term in, in the name of my fund, at least 80% of my assets in my fund have to be emerging markets. Otherwise, I can't call it the Emerging Markets Fund. Uh, why? Because it's misleading. Now, I could also name my fund something completely irre irrelevant. Like, I could call my fund, like, the, the Stardust Fund, right? You know, which is a totally inconsequential name, has nothing to do with a specific investment, and, you know, therefore the name rule really wouldn't apply. Uh, mutual funds are organized as corporations, all have boards of directors. And then oftentimes they'll share a board of directors for a family of funds. So, for example, like a, Fidel, a group of Fidelity mutual funds most likely will all have the same board of directors, right? Active versus passive management. Another a great topic that you have to know for this course and a uh, quiz, okay? Okay. Actively managed fund is the the goal of an actively actively managed fund is to outperform the benchmark. 
Uh, managers attempt to add value through security selection and or sector weighting. Let's say we have the S&P 500 bit, uh, index. That's what we base our performance off of. So when we base our performance off an index, let's say the S&P 500 stock index, which contain the 500 largest U.S. companies, approximately. Um, let's say that an index performs 3% this month, right? If we're an active manager, we're going to do some tilting on that index. We might overweight certain sectors. We might say, all right, we believe energy prices are going to go up, so we're going to overweight the energy sector, okay? Also, we might believe certain stocks might be very profitable, so we might overweight an Apple stock, an underweight in Facebook stock, um, you know, to add value. So if we're an active investment manager, we're also going to charge higher fees. So we're expected to outperform that benchmark. So if we perform like, you know, 3.5% versus the S&P 500, 3%, uh, it's probably not enough to cover the fees. Um, however, we perform 5%, uh, now we're 200 basis points or 2% above the benchmark, we're starting to really outperform the benchmark, which is very positive. Okay. Passively managed funds, the goal is simply to match whatever index you're benchmarking against. So we could be benchmarking against the S&P 500. We could be benchmarking against the global uh, MSCI All Country World Index, which is a composite of you know, all the stock markets. Uh, managers may purchase all components of securities of an index or a representative sample when they passively invest. So what does that mean? So if I'm passively investing in the S&P 500, I don't have to buy all 500 securities in the S&P 500 to mimic um, the performance of the S&P 500 index. Why? Because certain companies compose a larger percentage of that index than others. It's not an equally weighted index. So I might be able to mimic very, very closely the performance of the S&P 500 by only purchasing 50 to 100 securities. And I'm judged on my ability to mimic by what's called a tracking error. So if the S&P 500 performs 5% and I have a passive mutual fund and my performs 4.99%, that's good enough. I'm tracking the index. I'm doing a good job tracking the index. And the reason why you don't want to buy every security in the index, usually, is because it's expensive to buy every single security in the index. So you'd rather try to match the results based on um, you know, as few of the stocks as you need. Okay. Um, which is better? There is a big academic debate uh, with evidence on both sides. Uh, efficient market hypothesis, EMH. Be able to tell me what that is for a quiz. Okay. Adherents in some studies argue that active managers do not outperform over the long term and that higher fees wipe out any differences that may exist. Okay? If the markets are efficient, you know, no one's better at picking stocks. Now, when they say the efficient market hypothesis says that it's, you know, active managers don't outperform the market over time, they're using averages. The average investment manager doesn't outperform the average market over time, right? However, you know, uh, you could say the same thing about, you know, a, a baseball player, right? You know, there are baseball players, you could say the average baseball player only hits, you know, five home runs a year, right? But there are some baseball players who year in and year out are, you know, crushing the ball every single year. And we know those are good baseball players. The same thing can be said with investment managers. You know, there's some that are going to have a great year and then a horrible year. And there's some that are going to have consistently great records. And there's some that are going to have consistently bad records. And those ones will be uh, going out of business soon. Uh, supporters of active management in some studies argue that better success over shorter time periods in less liquid markets and broad markets and with very few talented uh, fund managers. Money market fund, just know the definition of this. Money market funds seek income and liquidity while maintaining a dollar uh, price by investing in short-term debt securities. So they're almost equivalent to a bank account in terms of the return they'll give. Every share is worth a dollar, and then every, every income, all the income you get is like interest income, right? Bond funds. If you have a bond mutual fund, guess what? It's comprised of bonds. Really easy, straightforward uh, question. Bond funds, bond funds invest primarily in debt, 
with maturities of uh, different lengths, generally over a year. Uh, so we have taxable bonds, which are uh, U.S. Treasury, high grade corporate, high yield. High yield is something called junk. It's a great little term to realize. If you have a high yield bond, that means it's paying a high level of interest rates. Why would someone or some, some organization pay high interest rates? Because maybe they have bad credit, okay? But if you believe that they'll be able to pay, then that's fine, you know? So for example, I own Netflix bonds, right? And Netflix bonds are paying around 8.5% interest, which is phenomenal. You know, but then we have you know American Airlines bonds, which also pay somewhere in that same range, but they have no ability to pay that debt. So they're both in that same risk category in terms of where they're priced, but they have very different risk structures. Okay? Asset back debt is like a credit card debt or car debt or uh, mortgage debt, and then there's global and foreign debt. You can buy debt from foreign countries. U.S. debt isn't the only debt you can buy. <clears throat> Hybrid funds create, contain both equity and bonds and other securities. Okay, could be a balanced fund or an asset allocation fund. You, for a retirement vehicle, if you want to be, you know, I don't want to say the word lazy, but if you are investing in your retirement, they might have target retirement date funds. So as you are younger, you're going to have a higher position in equities and a lower position in fixed income securities. And as you get older and your risk factors change it's going to flip. You're going to have more invested in fixed income and less invested in equity because to decrease your exposure to the changes in the market. Um, stock funds invest primarily in equities. This is basically the you know, uh, opposite of the fixed income stuff. So basically any type of equity can be contained in an equity fund. Domestic, value, growth, large cap, thematic funds. Um, what is a thematic fund? That's covered in a later chapter, but I could invest in a water fund or an oil fund, or you know, a, you know, a gaming fund, one that's only invested in you know, gaming companies. Let's hope it's not uh, Kurt Schilling's gaming company, okay? Uh, fund directors, intended to be fiduciaries, ensuring that service providers, especially in the management company, act in the best interest of the shareholder. Uh, independent or disinter disin uh, disinterested directors, uh, are the most suitable. Why? Because you don't want inside people uh, working on this, acting on your behalf supposedly, right? Uh, you want to make sure they're actually independent, right? It's typical size of a board is between 6 or 12, uh, often organized for a series of funds, as I mentioned before. Management companies, uh, often in the form of a family of funds and receive a similar set of services. So, like Fidelity, great example of a management company. Okay. Group of funds and controls is known as a fund complex. There are approximately 600 uh, separate organizations that are management companies, but the top 10 firms control about 48% of the market. It's easier to start a mutual fund than you think. I believe the last time I read you only need about $200,000 to $250,000 in assets. So uh, for starting a company, that's on, actually on the lower side, right? A uh, typical management company provides fund administration, investment advisory, distribution, and transfer agent processing, things we're going to cover in much greater detail later in the semester. The average return for a fund company after tax is 16% of AUM, which is a pretty nice return. Third party service providers, we'll touch base on this later, some functions that can be f performed uh, not as efficiently by a smaller investment manager will get outsourced. Example, this is transfer agent processing, printing, uh, it relates to economies of scale. So, you know, if you're a really small organization and you're printing, if you have to print books once a quarter, and you only print books once a quarter for two weeks, you're not going to hire somebody for two weeks once a quarter. You're going to outsource that activity. Investment advisors. These are the people that are the specialized individuals or groups that assist in the investment process. They're the ones making the decisions on what to buy and what to sell. Uh, they do not collect commission, they are paid a fee, right? So they get a flat fee based on the assets under management. Okay? Transfer agents, uh, transfer agent processing and customer service can uh, either, not wither, <laughs> be performed by the management company or outsourced. Large companies tend to perform this function themselves. It's considered the operations part of the business. Transfer agency uh, is basically the handling of the transfer of securities. Okay. 
Fund accountants maintain the accounting books of the fund. They maintain its value. How, what, what is the value of the fund? The value of the fund is the NAV. Okay? The NAV is the assets minus the liabilities of the fund divided by the amount of shares. Okay? That's their primary function. Great quiz question. There's two chapters, I believe, devoted to this topic later. So know what the NAV is. I would, I would definitely uh, be ready for a question on what is the NAV or what is the primary responsibility of fund accounts. Custodian can be a bank, a member of a national security exchange, the company itself, or a central uh, clearing system. They basically, they're, you know, think about what custody means. You know, they watch over the assets that are being managed by the investment company. It's almost like a firewall between the investment manager and the actual securities. Auditors basically come in to make sure that everything looks good on your books, right? They're a third party that goes and looks at the books. Uh, the board of directors votes annually to elect an auditing firm to independently review the accounting books. Analysts and rating agencies, I'm not going to focus too much on this. Um, one, because I don't think it's as relevant. Uh, and two, because of all the changes that, changes that are going on in, in this industry. Um, one thing that is always controversial is that the rating agencies are paid by the mutual fund firms to rate the securities. Now you would say, doesn't that sound a little funny? I, like, I could pay a, I'm paying a company to rate something for me. Do you think there's a possibility for a conflict of interest there? Like they want my business so they might inflate my ratings so that I keep going back to them? I mean, you know, they say no, but it's possible. Um, brokers and other intermediaries, you should know that they play two major roles. Assist in the execution of trades on behalf of the PM. And a brokerage firm can make money through the spread, the difference between the bid-ask price. So if they're selling something for 102 and somebody's willing to buy it for one dollar, you know, they'll make the difference on that spread. Uh, brokerage firms can charge ongoing asset back fees, 12B1 fees as I talked about before, front-end sales charges, or back-end sales charges. Depending on the arrangement they have um, with the investment advisor. Uh, regulators, I would know the SEC is the primary regula regulator. Uh, I would know what the SEC. I would know what the difference between the SEC and the NASD is. And uh, that's it for chapter three. So uh, again, uh, please be participating in the message boards, doing the quizzes, doing the homework, and I look forward to uh, talking with you guys more next week.